I'm Stephen Scheuer, welcoming you to another in our series of oral histories in which we are fortunate indeed to be able to interview those persons who have helped shape the style and substance of television and our major media today. We're thrilled to have you with us on your 83rd birthday, and this is May 9th, 2001. There's a rumor that under all that on-camera, in-your-face style, especially when interviewing villains, there lives a great big pussycat. Are you guilty of that charge? Probably. Yeah. The, I've been nosy since I was that high. And uh, I, I, I remember the first time that I did a television broadcast. It was a WBKB in Chicago, immediately after the war. And the lights and the heat and the fact that I had some pockmarking here led me to believe I would never make it until I adored radio and I had an interesting voice. And uh, little by little, because you couldn't do anything wrong and you couldn't be excessively ugly on television, little by little I found my way. And that, of course, was an extraordinary time in television. Uh, Dave Garraway at large, Kukla Fran and Ollie. Making up the medium as they went along. Absolutely. It's absolutely and, true. And a lot of wonderful work was done in Chicago, which oh, most folks don't realize. The so-called Chicago School developed their studs, Turkle. There were all, such a crowd of us just trying to find our way. And back in those days, it was all right if you could do news on radio. And I worked for a man by the name of Clifton Utley at the Chicago Sun, who was Garrick Utley's dad mm -hmm. at the time, uh, in radio news. But also, I announced Sky King, brought to you by Peter Pan Peanut Butter. And uh, back in those days, you could do anything. You were born in, in Brookline, Massachusetts, and graduated from the University of Michigan in, in 1939. How did you decide to go to Michigan? And was that one of the kind of the first gravitational pull to working in Chicago broadcasting? Uh, no, really. I went to Michigan because my uncle was chairman of the economics department there, a man by the name of Leo Scharfman, who was in, in uh, Franklin Roosevelt's brain trust. He was a railroad economist. I mean, he, that's. He was, he was the chairman of the economics department and quite a guy. And uh, so a lot of the cousins, grandchildren, nephews, nieces went to Ann Arbor. And from there, because I couldn't find a job in 1939, I auditioned for a job as a radio announcer in Muskegon, Michigan. Was turned down. Depression. Went to the National Music Camp where I worked. They couldn't meet your salary demands in Muskegon, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> no, they just wasn't. They simply were not interested in Myron Wallace. And uh, I went up to Muskegon to, to uh, audition. And uh, so a fellow by the name of Joseph Maddy, Professor Joseph Maddy, was running the National Music Camp up in Interlochen, Michigan. And I had done some things with him and for him. Uh, Fun in Music was the name of the, of the series that we did. And I was the announcer on it. And he said, well, Myron, come on up. Come on up to Interlochen. I'll pay you 25 bucks a month and room and board, and you'll work with your good friend, Jerome Wiesner. Jerry Wiesner. Very distinguished scientist who was the head of MIT some years later. That's correct. So Jerry, I was Jerry's assistant at the National Music Camp in the summer of 1939, just in ju Helping him understand quantum <laughs> physics, I assume. <laughs> oh, no doubt, <laughs> no doubt. He was actually, he was the engineer in the campus radio station <laughs> back then in Ann Arbor. 
and walked around with his Meerschaum pipe and his dog, his St. Bernard fag. In any case, I had a good time up there. And suddenly I received a note from the professor at Ann Arbor with whom I worked, Waldo Abbott, who was the chairman of radio television. It didn't exist back then. And he said, uh, there's a job open at W. OOD in Grand Rapids, they want you to come down and audition. So I got on a train, went down there, and that's when I began at 20 bucks a week at WOOD as M Myron Wallace. I wanted to change my name because I didn't particularly like the name Myron. But there was a Scotsman by the name of Sandy Meek who said, no, 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 Myron, Myron, that's, there's quality in that. And so Mike didn't take place until I moved to Chicago. What would prompted your move to Chicago? I came to Chicago because a woman by the name of Erna Phillips, who wrote soap operas, fell in love with my voice. The doyen of soap operas for That's a long correct. time. My, my. And she needed somebody to uh, narrate the road of life, the story of Dr. Jim Brent, brought to you by Chipso, C-H-I-P-S-O, Chipso for your, in any case. And so she persuaded Procter & Gamble to uh, hire me, having come down from Detroit, WXYZ, where I was the news ace, uh, to, uh, for I think it was, I think it was 112 bucks a week, which was huge back then. And I'd, I did commercials, and then I, also began to do news on WMAQ, as you pointed out, which was the NBC affiliate mm -hmm. there. And that's when I really first got into, into television. Uh, not news, interviews of a sort, uh, a couple of game shows. I worked with Bergen Evans in a, in a it was called Majority Rules, and it, Bergen Evans was a professor, I believe, at Northwestern, English professor, uh, and also played in the television drama. I was Michael Kidd, a detective. I was doing commercials for Peter Pan Peanut Butter and doing the 11 o'clock, or the late news, I forget whether it was 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock news on WMA. Fairly WMA. literally a Myron of all trades That's at that exactly time. right. And it was still Myron. It was only later that I... How important was for you, as you in your training, as you look back on it, was your stint at the Chicago Sun, the, new, the uh, well, Sun working Times? with working, I, I worked with Clifton Utley, mm -hmm. who was the, the H.V. Calton born of Chicago at the time. He was a fine, fine man, Garrick's dad. Uh, and anybody who worked with him was bound to learn a great deal uh, and this was purely radio. This was still radio. But in that, on that group, on that staff, were Bill Costello, who later became a very well-known and important news correspondent at CBS, a man by the name of Albert Parry, who was a Russian expert, Arch Farmer, Mike Connor. I should remember. Bill Croker. Mm -hmm. we, we had, we lived up at the top, we worked up at the top of the Daily, Chicago Daily News building. Mm -hmm. And we were on the air on the, every hour on the half hour, all day long, at a radio station called WJWC, the initials for John W. Clark, who ostensibly owned the, the radio station. Actually, it was a Marshall Field radio station. And uh, little by little, I began to find my way and knew that I rather enjoyed doing this. And news. you got a discount at Marshall Field Department no, Store, so no, life was no. very good. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> but you didn't stay there very long, because by 1951, you were in New York. That's correct. At CBS. Back in Chicago, I had worked for the Bond Clothing Company. Did the news for them. That, they were the sponsor on WMAQ. And they wanted me to come to New York to, they wanted to sponsor a newscast with They me. had a very big presence in New York at the time, Bond on Broadway, a huge That's story, correct. I remember. 
And so uh, I did good commercials. That's why they wanted me. And uh, at that time, I became partners with, Tate, with Ted Yates. Who One of the most distinguished television producers ever, really. And that's who, quite right. Who had a catastrophic end in, in Israel, covering with his customary bravery. Uh, First day of the Six-Day War, shot yeah. through the head by an Israeli sharpshooter. He was on the Arab side, leaving behind three young boys. And of course, his, his wife, Mary, to whom I am now married and have been for 16, One of the loveliest things years. that ever happened to you. Absolutely and right. And deservedly. Absolutely right. And how did we get from there to Dumont and your Nightbeat show, which launched well, your well, what happened in was such a big way? We, Ted and I did the 7 and 11 o'clock news on Channel 5, which was Dumont. That's what, they, that's what Bond clothes wanted me to do. And they sponsored and so we did a really a, a good newscast. Ted was a wonderful producer. And what was the nature of his skill? Because he was very much admired at the time by everybody who worked with him. The nature of his skill was in, in organizing. He, he, was, he was ahead of his time. He really was. He was a big, good-looking cowboy type who didn't want to go on the air. He wanted to behind, be behind the scenes as a producer. And... Um, Television news, local television news at the time was... Very primitive. That's exactly right. And he wanted to make it less primitive. And so we, he had me out on the street working as a, as a television reporter back then. And, uh, and it was there that finally we decided instead of doing the 7 and 11 o'clock news, we'll do the 7 o'clock news, but then we'll take the 11 to 12 o'clock hour and do something called Night Beat. This was in 1956, and Nightbeat back then was a, one of those instant New York hits. Everybody in the world watched it every night, Monday through Friday. And it started with news, and then we did either one or two interviews. It's a little bit like the, what the Charlie Rose broadcast does, except we were more insistent, more abrasive but uh, talked as much as Charlie still does. Uh, our questions were long. And everybody in the world wanted to come on that broadcast. And after only about eight or nine months, Leonard Goldenson at ABC said, hey, how would you like to do that on the network? And so I did, did it for a while, both on Night Beat and at ABC a half hour once a week, and then left behind Nightbeat. A fellow by the name of John Wingate took over Nightbeat, and I did the Mike Wallace interview for a couple of years over at ABC. And then we moved from ABC to Channel 13 with the Mike Wallace interview. Was there a meaningful difference between doing your show at D Dumont and, and doing it at ABC? Well, uh, yes, because when you're talking to New Yorkers it's, on Channel 5 locally, and you're talking to, about their concerns, about what they know about, there was a community between the, the interviewer and some of the people that I interviewed and the audience. When we went only, and you had four or five nights a week to, to uh, you get yourself an audience, when you down to one half hour with one interviewee, Live though it was, it was uh, it was difficult, really, to uh, you had all your eggs in that one basket. You had made your living in the early days of black and white television, as I did. You'd know that sometimes it was a little like the early days of flying, a seat of the pants experience. We all have something to apologize for, don't you think? Listening to architect Frank Lloyd Wright focus on one of my bad habits was embarrassing. Embarrassing mainly because it took place on a show sponsored by the Philip Morris Tobacco Company. Is that something that you feel like apologizing for? Not at all. I enjoy it. Can I offer but such was the stuff of live television. May I offer you one? No, thank you. I wouldn't know how to smoke it. 
by 1950s broadcasts Nightbeat and the Mike Wallace interview were unrehearsed. We'll try to find out why. No retakes. Whatever the guest said or did, the viewer saw and heard. Maybe my brain isn't big enough. Maybe I don't have a global mind. For instance, this 1959 exchange with the feisty head of the transport workers' union, Mike Quill. I was trying to get the combative union boss to reconcile his alleged left leanings. He was called Red Mike with his strict Catholic upbringing. You raised the religious question. I don't like that question to be raised. I have told you on more than one occasion that I am a Catholic. Yes. That I don't beat my breast and say that I'm the best Catholic in the world. And you have no right to sit in judgment on me. I'm not sitting in judgment. I'm simply asking a question. We are doing a profile of my quote. I'm answering you the question. How many more times must I answer it? All right. All right. You want another answer on it? I think that you've done it pretty well. I'm ready any time you want to repeat the stupid question. All right, Mike. That was the kind of thing. That was nice. The candor of that. Well, the candor of it and the willingness to, to wrestle. And Mike Quill had such a good time. He really had a very good time. And we were pals at that time. And, and it was a joy. And everybody watched it. Everybody watched it. It was Frank Lloyd right there. That was on the Mike Wallace interview. I mean, come on. This is, this is a giant architect. And he used to watch the Mike Wallace interview. So all kinds of people came on. And at that time, we had... We were well, battling to get on because it was the place to be seen. That's exactly right. That's, and at that time, this was the first time that people had really done research. And that's something that Ted Yates, the producer of it, started. So you were very well prepared for whatever Very well prepared up. and found, you know, we would inspect newspaper morgues and, and that kind of thing. And, it was, it was a ball. We're going to see a clip now of another one that was very important. Uh, American, in, American Revolution, if you will, having to do with some of the black activists. And there's a piece on Malcolm X. What we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. Malcolm X was a man of intellect and courage. He came out of the ghetto, out of prison, and eventually he relented in his bitterness toward the white man and achieved a position of strength and influence in the civil rights movement. These are the things you should want to find out before you say, hooray, hooray, hooray. Is that right or wrong? But then, in 1965, he was assassinated, gunned down in New York by followers of the late Elijah Muhammad, leader of the Black Muslims. He will destroy you! I had no idea how prophetic Malcolm was in 1964, just months before he was killed, when he gave one of the reasons why he had broken with the Black Muslims and with Elijah Muhammad in particular. He made six sisters pregnant. They all had children. Two of those six had two children. Uh, uh, one of those two is having a child right now. I am told that there is a seventh sister who is supposed to be in Mexico right now, and she's supposed to be having a child by him. Well, do you feel perhaps that you should now take over the leadership of the black Muslims? No, I have no desire to take over the leadership of the black Muslims, and I have never had that desire. But I do have this desire. I have a desire to see the Afro-American in this country get the human rights that are his due to make a complete human being. Are you the least bit afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh, yes. I probably am a dead man already. And that was uh, about five, six months before he was killed. He was a friend of mine. I couldn't, when we did a piece called The Hate That Hate Produced in 1959, Ted Yates and I, and a reporter by the name, a black reporter by the name of Louis Lomax, whom we had hired. He was, I mean, you didn't hire black reporters for white television back then, and we hired Louis, who was a first-rate reporter. And he told me, I didn't know anything about the black Muslims. White America didn't know at all. And a lot of black America didn't understand fully the impact of that. The, uh, we did a, we, when I first told the story, Jack Gould, then the television critic of the New York Times, raised the Dickens about this, my penchant for sensationalism and talking about the black Muslims and, and in effect giving them a certain legitimacy that they didn't have. And he was so desperately out of touch with what was going on. Yes, he was. He was. It took them six months, 
And finally, they had a front page story about the black Muslims. And at the very bottom of that, after we, I reminded them how I had seen the Bulldog edition and they hadn't said anything about, about the piece, we did that at uh, 1959, yeah, at, at uh, Channel 13. I reminded them when I saw the Bulldog edition of the Times uh, that, that they had not credited where all this information had begun. And finally, they, they put it in. Gould was at that time out of touch with a lot of, but nonetheless a first rate, a first rate. Mm. Uh, he was being supplanted back then by a fellow by the name of John Crosby, who was a very interesting. Who was at the critic. New York Herald Tribune critic. Correct. Correct. Mm. When but I Malcolm, it was a tragedy. It really, it was a tragedy for America. It was a tragedy for Black America. He, he was a fine fine man. And he used to say, we'll do it by any means necessary, but you, you will find it very difficult to point to a single act of violence that he triggered. He hated the white man. He, Malcolm, right. Malcolm hated the white right. man and believed that the white man was evil, as Elijah Muhammad did. And finally, he really he thought and thought and began to talk and began to have some white friends. Lou Lomax took me to breakfast with him after this, the hate that hate produced. He wanted to meet me because he had seen what we had done. And that was the beginning of a serious friendship. Uh, and as I say, I think it, it's a tragedy that he was shot down because he was a leader. Tell me about your feelings when you were first asked by Don Hewitt to be on 60 Minutes. And did you have any idea that it would be, turn out to be this epical, ongoing adventure? No, not at all. I was, at, at, when I was asked by Don Hewitt to, uh, he came over to the house and began to uh, talk about this new magazine show. And he, it was not, it didn't have a name yet. And, and he was in, not in, ill repute, but he was, he was out of a job effectively. He was a, had a job with CBS, but he hadn't been doing very much because he was considered apparently by the powers that be at the time, Fred Friendly, Etzel, etc., as uh, not really a serious news fella. Uh, in any case, uh, he came over and I wasn't... The first discussion of the 60 Minutes notion from Don to the powers that be at CBS was they turned, they turned the show down, if I remember correctly. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, 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 Dick Salant didn't want to do it. Did not want to do it. And only later, and Hewitt tells the story, only later when he heard <coughs> that uh, Fred Friendly had turned it down, when Salant heard that, right. he said, well, under those circumstances, because there was a certain tension between friendly and salant, uh, that he decided to go ahead with it. But I, I hadn't, couldn't make up my mind whether I wanted conceivably to go to the White House as the correspondent in the White House, because I believed that Nixon was going to be the president, or go along with this as yet unnamed venture with this out-of-work producer by the name of Don Hewitt, who was a, a friend but he was, he was not the most, most uh, they didn't understand the man's genius is what it amounted mm -hmm. to sufficiently at that time. And thank God I, I made the, I zagged instead of zigging and uh, got the opportunity. And of course, I was not his first choice. Harry Reasoner was going to be the sole anchor of 60 Minutes at the beginning. And they decided that he was too nice a guy, that they needed, he was going to wear the white hat, and they needed somebody to wear the black hat, and I was chosen. Good evening. This is 60 Minutes. It's a kind of a magazine for television, which means it has the flexibility and diversity of a magazine adapted to broadcast journalism. And our first cover story is about cops by the top cop. Chances are that you were watching television when they were balloting at the Republican convention. So was the man who won that nomination. 
and a 60 Minutes cameraman was there, the only television cameraman in the room. And we thought we'd last maybe 13 weeks or 26 weeks or what the dickens. Well, we're now past the 26-year point. When did you, I mean, 60 Minutes has done such epical stories that have uh, transformed parts of American life, gotten people out of prison, uh, introduced new legislation of great consequence. When did you and your colleagues begin to understand the, the, the clout, clout and uh, power what happened of what was, you were doing? What happened was no one paid any attention to us for the first three, four, five years that we were on the air. We were on Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock opposite the NBC Tuesday night movie and I think it was Marcus Welby or whatever, a, a big hit on ABC. So we'd finish regularly 85th out of 100 shows in a week on the, in the ratings. And little by little, we had the chance to develop the character of the broadcast. Harry Reasoner decided to take off for ABC because he was waiting for Cronkite to get hit by a truck crossing Fifth Avenue when it looked as though Walter was going to survive forever and Harry really wanted to be the anchor of the CBS Evening News. And then there was a disastrous mismatch with Barbara Walters. Yes, yeah. but he went over to ABC. Anchors. And then Hugh and I and Palmer Williams and so forth, who was the number two guy, what are we going to do? We're, gonna, we're losing Harry. And... And that is when we decided to start doing investigations, which eventually became the hallmark of 60 Minutes. That's what really made the difference. And almost from the beginning, I still think it, it, it began to happen during the 1973 war, the Yom Kippur War, when suddenly there were a whole bunch of people who couldn't get gasoline for their cars on a Sunday. We, by this time, we had moved to Sunday. And they couldn't get gasoline. For that the, was a pivotal event, though, in the history of the show, moving to Sunday, Sunday night. Seven. Right. A fellow by the name of Oscar Katz, who was the head of, of, uh, of research. You should talk to him. The head of research at CBS at that time. Too hard to get to Oscar. He's moved upstairs. Oh, has he left? Mm. I didn't know. He was a fine fellow. Wonderful man. He said, 6 o'clock Sunday. And that's where we went first, and then, of course, later on, moved to 7 o'clock Sunday. He said, believe me, it will do very, very well there. So there we are on Sundays, and the, there was no gasoline. So people were stuck. They couldn't go to Grandma's in the car on Sunday afternoon, and they began to look at their television set, turn the dial and see what was on, and we were on. And suddenly, I'm quite serious, you could see the ratings went like that. And by that time, we knew who we were, and we were doing all manner of things that had not been done in television investigation. What before. was a piece of yours, one or two of your early pieces, that helped you understand the extraordinary impact that 60 Minutes was uh, having? A, a couple of them, a couple of them. One was something called false ID, in which it became quite apparent that you could make a false, you could get yourself false ID, and under those circumstances, you could, you could uh, cash checks, you could uh, <laughs> get passports, you could get, I mean, truly, there was a big commercial gain to be had by people who, who uh, got themselves from false ID cards and could use them, that could buy, they, you, you'd give them their, you'd, you'd get an airplane ticket and use your false ID to identify yourself, things of that nature. And that was one. Another was uh, the clinic on Morse Avenue in which we, for the first time, used cameras behind one-way mirrors. And, and suddenly, you would see people confessing, if you will, telling what they were about criminal acts. Not, n not being persuaded to, but, but uh, when, when we had the dope, there was a producer by the name of Barry Lando with whom I worked back then, and when we had the dope on them and we had documents and things of that nature, and they didn't realize that they were on camera, they thought it was just, they were just talking to a reporter. 
We have another uh, very interesting clip from 60 Minutes of your uh, interviewing then-President Nixon. There's been so much talk in recent years of style and of charisma. No one suggests that either you or your opponent, Hubert Humphrey, have a good deal of it. Have you given no thought to this aspect of campaigning and of leading? Well, when style and charisma connotes the idea of uh, contriving of public relations, uh, I don't buy it at all. Uh, as I look back on the history of this country, uh, some of our great leaders uh, would not have been perhaps great television personalities, but they were great presidents because of what they stood for, uh, because of their principle, their courage, their character. Now, uh, I hope to win this election. If I do win this election, I think I will conduct the presidency in a way that I will command the respect of the American people. That may not be the same style of some of my predecessors, uh, but it will enable me to lead. Uh, let, me, let me make this one point. Some, some public men are destined to be loved, and other public men are destined to be disliked. Uh, but the most important thing about a public man is not whether he's loved or disliked, but whether he's respected. And I hope to restore respect to the presidency. Imagine. It was one of the first 60 minutes. He was running in 1968 for the presidency. And I had not known him. And he would talk to anybody back then because he needed the coverage. And, and I began to like him, too. And I had a, a certain amount of face time with him because there were four or five of us, of us who were covering Nixon. Uh, at that time, Herb Kaplow over at NBC and, and Bob Semple for the New York Times. And <clears throat> what was it about Nixon that you found appealing? He was, uh, he had made the determination that he was going to try to, to make himself open to a certain degree with reporters. And we hit it off. Matter of fact, he... Uh, he offered you a job at one point. He offered point. me the job as uh, uh, of his a job as his press secretary during the campaign, actually in February of 1968, and happily I turned it down, but because but, I would not make a good press secretary. But he was smart as the Dickens, and... How could um, he have made such dumb decisions, including oh, the stuff about the tapes and the things that led to his uh, downfall? Uh, that's, I say he was smart as the Dickens. You're smart as the Dickens, and so am I, but think of all the errors that we've made along the way, Steve. The, the, you know something? Pat Nixon was labeled Plastic Pat by Gloria Steinem. I knew Pat Nixon, Patricia Nixon, knew her. I, I had dealings with her during that campaign. Warm, vulnerable, smart as could be, bruised badly by what had happened prior to 1968 with her husband and, and the electorate. And uh, a much misunderstood individual, and I, I wanted so badly to get her to talk about it. She never did. Never did. Never did. On the night that he won the New Hampshire primary, I remember very well, I was covering uh, Richard Nixon in 68. And he had his offices here in New York City at uh, Park Avenue and 57th Street at that time. And I approached, when it was apparent that, that he had won the New Hampshire primary, uh, I, I uh, went over and, and interviewed him. And then I said she was standing with him. And I began to interview her. And you could feel her hand shaking. She was scared to death, really, of, uh, of talking to the press. And I went back to uh, Cronkite was anchoring the coverage that night. And I went back to the studio to tell Cronkite what had happened. I was a reporter then. This was prior to 60 Minutes. And immediately following, I got a call from Dick Nixon to thank me for being so kind to Pat. He was, he, he was a complicated fellow. He was a complicated man who did, in my estimation, I mean, Watergate, Watergate, 
just so stupid, um, who did some very good things, some very, very good things for the economy. Opening China. a discourse with China. China. Um, welfare. Head Start. He was all for that. One of the most extraordinary pieces that uh, you did was an interview with the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini in, in Iran, and we're going to take a peek at that now. I interviewed the Shah's successor only once. It was shortly after the Americans at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran had been taken hostage, and the Ayatollah Khomeini made it clear in the interview that those hostages would not be going home soon. But the question that drew his attention most palpably was this one. Imam President Sadat of Egypt, a devoutly religious man, a Muslim, says that what you are doing now is, quote, a disgrace to Islam. And he calls you, Imam, forgive me, his words, not mine, a lunatic. The translator worried about even translating the question, but he did. That's, yes, that's, that's what I heard President Sadat say on American television yes. that the Imam is a disgrace to Islam yes. and he used the word a lunatic. And the Ayatollah promptly called for the assassination of Anwar Sadat, which of course is just what happened. He called for the assassination. He suggested that he would not be around for a long, long time. He said that Sadat himself was not, not a good Muslim. It was fascinating. The uh, he, he didn't look at me, the, the Khomeini. I don't think he was looking at me there. It's the only time that he, I made eye contact. He would simply drone on about the fact that he was not going to, the, 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 unless the Shah went back to um, Iran and faced the music there, he was not going to let the hostages go. And it was always either straight ahead or down, and we were sitting on the carpet in his television studio in, studio in the holy city of Qum. And uh, when, I, when I asked that question, and the translator said, <coughs> Mr. Wallace, in effect, he said, you're the lunatic if you think that I'm going to translate that. I said. <laughs> well, for the translator, the notion, if it flashed through his mind, that an Iranian journalist would ask that question, he would have been taken out and executed within a matter of minutes. The strange thing was that the Shah whom I interviewed a lot, was um, very open to all kinds of questions. And you could ask him anything, anything. But, uh, and that revolution still, here we are in the 2001, and they still have that narrow, foolish group running that country. One of the more interesting developments, and uh, to be charitable about it, because uh, it, it concerns me very much, is the, in the last year or 18 months, there's been a, a significant increase in the ratings and the attention given to Fox News. And it has a conser demonstrable conservative bias to it, reflecting the owner ownership by Rupert Murdoch and uh, the uh, head of, of Fox News, Roger Ailes, uh, and they've gained ratings considerable. Uh, they surely have on on CNN. Does that give you pause at all? And do you think no. it would ever uh, occur to the chieftains at the three networks to have uh, changed the their kind of straightforward approach to the news now, based on the success of, of Fox? How, how do you feel about? the fact that it's clearly Fox in some way an organ for Rupert Murdoch's yeah. conservative views. It's a free country. It's a free country. Forever, you know as well as I, we have been charged, we in the, in the news establishment, with being excessively liberal. Charge was always nonsense. Uh, absolute nonsense. We certainly, <laughs> we didn't succeed in, in, in electing as many presidents if we had that much influence. Richard Nixon would not have been president, and Ronald Reagan would not have been president, and George Bush, and so forth. No, it, wa it was nonsense. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. I think the Fox phenomenon, and that is it, 
Matter of fact, I'm going to be doing a piece about it, I hope, for Paul. When you take a look at O'Reilly and some of the others, but O'Reilly is the... And I mean, his Roger book, The O'Reilly, is really, you know, some full of vapidities and uh, exaggerations. It's not the work of, of a serious journalist. He doesn't, I think. he doesn't pretend to be. He doesn't pretend to be. He's smart as the Dickens. He really is. And he is, I mean, what are you going to do? Wring your hands and, and, and uh, crucify Rush Limbaugh? The, the, the fact is that there is an appetite for a different point of view. Mm -hmm. We'll show you the news. What, what do they say? We report, you decide. Right. There's, an, there's obviously an audience for it outside, out there. And Which when they radio has demonstrated for many years, of course, and but they've never had it in television, and they are now outrating. I'm told CNN. Yes, I mm. mean they just rolled and gained it. on MSNBC as well. Exactly, but I would love, in the course of this piece, I would love to talk. I want to talk to Roger Ailes. I want to talk to O'Reilly. I want to talk with uh, Rupert. Uh, Bruce, you might have something interesting oh, Bruce, to say. I, uh, yes, I mean, come on. These are all good, solid, patriotic Americans who have a different view of life, conceivably from uh, you and your colleagues up in Martha's Vineyard. Well, the, where the gospel is preached by our pal Art Buckwald. That's and, and William Styron and, and so forth. Right. I mean, come on, that's... that's uh, although... When you talk about the, the vineyard, Edgartown, of course, is the home of, uh, it's a Republican stronghold. But, but the, the Eastern establishment liberal crowd. And Bradley and rascals like that. They, 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 they're getting their ox gored. Mm. And it's about time that there was somebody who did to them what they had been doing to the other side for such a long time. Mm -hmm. One of the ironies of, of television news, it seems to me, and has seemed to me for a long time, is that the one subject that television news virtually never covers, and practically never covers honestly, is television itself. And that situation has been true for more than 30 years. Uh, they virtually never deal with the Federal Communications Commission and, and its importance on the regulatory issues or public interest issues. And there's been virtually no commentary on, uh, on the networks about the profound shift in, in broadcasting and cable over the last decade, where more and more power and outlets are concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, whether it's Viacom and your CBS colleagues, or uh, Disney, or Rupert Murdoch, and AOL Time Warner. Uh, do you think that's healthy? I no, mean, I don't think it's healthy. I don't. You, you know what uh, TiVo is? Yes, indeed. Do you I have, have one? one? Do you yes. use one? Yes. You do. I, I've never been able really to, to uh, understand how to put it together. So. But uh, I'm going to go to MIT for two weeks to take the course, and then I'll come up to Martha's Vineyard and show you how to run it. Very good. Look, when, we, when there was talk about TiVo, and we decided that we wanted to do a piece about TiVo, mm -hmm. I talked with Les Moonves. CBS has a small investment in TiVo. I'm sure all the networks do. And they, have, they, and they have a big investment in not letting people have equipment that will let them erase the commercials, too. They I haven't think, figured that out either. That's the point. That's <laughs> the point. The, the fact is that you can zap commercials with TiVo. So they are not comfortable with it. And there's all kinds of talk about what will replace commercials. How will they pay for programs? Is that going to make for more pay TV for, in, in, instead of having commercials pay for TV, have the audience pay for TV? There was no objection to our putting the piece on the air, I must say. CBS did not want to talk to us about it. Nor, nor did NBC, nor did ABC want to talk to us. About the TiVo piece. About the TiVo piece. Right. They, because it's, they, they don't know how to handle right. it yet. But in the... I've been there since 63 as a correspondent. The only time, the only time that we were per 
prevented from piece, putting a piece on the air was... The tobacco story. The tobacco story, exactly. And eventually, of course, we got the piece on the air after the Wall Street Journal had gone ahead of us and mm -hmm. because they said that they were afraid of a, uh, of a huge lawsuit that could really cost them billions of dollars. But Eric Ober, who was the president of CBS News at the time, and who was a good friend of mine and a man I admire, for whatever reason, he must have been told by BlackRock, don't let this go on the air. And a woman named of Ellen Caden, who was the general counsel. I can't believe that the general counsel was operating on her own. There, that, that, that story, who kept that from going on the air, has still not been told in my estimation. Uh, Peter Lund was the head of CBS, ran CBS at that time. And I said to Peter, and he, he thought probably that I was, if, I, if he didn't grant me this permission, that I was going to quit. It was not my intention to quit. I figured I could do better by staying and fighting inside. And it turned out that we got the piece on the air eventually. But we had, we had a piece uh, without naming Jeffrey Wigand, without naming Brown and Williamson. All of the rest of the information was there, but we could not take on the, the uh, tobacco company. Most people who, who criticize CBS about it and said, uh, Wallace should be tougher, Safer should be tougher, Don Hewitt should be tougher, didn't really understand the fact that the tobacco companies, I think, are so damn litigious that they could have sued for four or five billion dollars and, and literally put CBS out of business if they won. If they won, and that was one of the things. But, but, Peter Lund had the courage. I said, Peter, if we're going to do this uh, sanitized piece without naming mm -hmm. Wigand and Brown and Williamson, then I am going to have to say at the end of this piece how disappointed I am that CBS has seen fit to keep us from doing it, that it's the first time in forever that that has happened, the only time that it has happened. And for some reason, that got lost in the discussion. I mean, for, for the, the senior correspondent on, on 60 Minutes to say, hey, they let us down. Our bosses let us down and put it on the air. It was quite extraordinary, I thought. As we said at the beginning, the tobacco companies maintain the leaked documents we told you about do not tell the whole story. So we invited the tobacco companies, including Lorillard, the company owned by the same company that owns CBS, to tell us the whole story. They declined. As we also said, we wanted to publish an interview with a former high-ranking tobacco executive who might be able to tell us what the companies wouldn't tell us. But CBS management told us we couldn't do that. Why? Because the insider had signed that confidentiality agreement, and because we knew about it, the cigarette company that he worked for could sue us for, they would claim, inducing him to break that agreement. And the potential liability to CBS as a result could reach into the billions of dollars. All of this, of course, speaks to a disturbing reality, that news organizations can be sued not for the truth or falsity of what they report, but instead just for seeking out information from insiders who have material important to the public health and welfare, but who have signed confidentiality agreements. Is your confidentiality agreement with still in force? Yes, it is. So that, what, what are they gonna do, sue you for making this appearance? I would bet on it. If I gave you the Scheuer magic wand and it enabled you to make any changes you wanted in the way American television up and cable operates now. What what would you do? How how would you like to see things? I think it's pretty good. The, I think the, the television, by and large, is pretty good. I deplore the fact, as I said, about the the. There's only one word for it: the crap. That is on afternoons. Mm -hmm. um, the violent stuff in the evening bothers you less. Uh, it. It bothers me less than that. Yes, it mm. does. I confess that it does. I wish that we that it was not as violent. And we make all kinds of promises all the time. I say we. 
management and then, and then the question of censorship gets involved and then the question of money gets involved and Congress and, and so forth. But by and large, it's a pretty good menu. You want news, you want serious news, you got it. The evening news is a pretty darn good broadcast. In the very day that we're talking, uh, NBC has named Andy Lack, who's the head of, who was at this hour the head of CBS New, of NBC News, to be uh, maybe the designated heir to the entire NBC operation. I think Andy's first rate. Uh, at the time of the Westmoreland business, I think he dropped the ball. He was at CBS at that time, and uh, he could have been helpful, more helpful at that time. But he is, uh, I admire what he has done with NBC News. Uh, I think that CNBC and MSNBC are, under the circumstances that, that exist, you've got to make a living, which you're going to, and, and as you go around the country, particularly, I mean, around the world, particularly in Europe, you see NBC all over the lot. I deplore the fact that, that Larry Tisch saw fit to kill any kind of cable operation, and we've been trying to play catch up ever since. Unsuccessfully. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Apropos of Tish, do, when, I mean, you have such a unique uh, understanding of that, starting with the years when it was run by William Paley, then Lawrence Tish, and then West Westinghouse uh, owned it, and now Viacom. Were there any meaningful changes that you folks in the news division felt as the ownership of the changed from the Paley years? Oh, of course. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Larry Tisch was a, a disaster for CBS altogether. For what reasons, other than the fact that he cut the overseas money. news bureaus money. a lot? Money, money, money. He just, and there's nothing wrong. There was some fat there. But uh, he, uh, he impressed me immensely when I first met Larry Tisch. I figured he had all the money in the world. And now he was going to take what was the Tiffany Network and the finest news division in, of all three. And he's now going to luxuriate in the opportunity to be, to continue the Paley-Stanton tradition. And he lied. And he, and he uh, to some degree anyway, uh, set about disemboweling the news division. For a great many years, the glory of television, surely in the 50s and 60s, uh, was the extraordinary quality of the CBS News staff, not only the executives like uh, Fred Friendly, but you know all your colleagues, Murrow and Eric Severide and uh, Oh, and, uh, you, uh, you can know, go to Charlie and uh, Cronkite, Collingwood, Alexander Winston Burdett. Uh, uh, I, I think that that team is is not anywhere to be found today. Are there anywhere? Young, are there young journalists that you admire now who you think? Uh, you know who I admire? Potential? I I think one of the best White House correspondents I've seen in forever is a fellow by the name of John King at CNN. Mm -hmm. He's a good. Stan, I saw him just yesterday interviewing um, the vice president, Dick Cheney. He, he knows his story. I've seen him with Clinton. I've seen him n with Bush. Um, and he must be, I don't know, and I would imagine he's probably still in his 30s. Right. Uh, look, we have fine people, truly. I don't want to protest too much, but we have fine people at CBS still. Um, it's not like the old days when on the Cronkite News, the CBS Evening News was Walter Cronkite and Charles Collingwood in whatever, Winston Burdett at the Vatican, Nelson Benton in, I mean, face it. There were brief moments in television news where, where people uh, were given the opportunity to do short but television op-ed pieces. Oh, Eric Severi did Sever it, John Severi Chancellor, did. Bill Moyers. Why do you think there's nothing like that on the air now? I don't know. Would you I like to know. see it? Of course I would like to see it. But they, 
I, I think that they believe that they believe that there is not the audience out there for that kind of thing. Look, the evening news don't have the clout at all that they used to have. When you think about the fact of a Cronkite and a Huntley Brinkley and a Howard K. Smith, let's say, I mean, that they, there are now all kinds of anchors and all kinds of believable or, or to some degree, unbelievable mm -hmm. individuals anchoring the news. And um, there is not the willingness to spend the money that you have to spend in order to produce. I'm going to close this interview with a quote from Don Hewitt's book, Tell Me a Story. And Hewitt says, Mike Wallace is quite frankly the best thing that ever happened to a television set, certainly the best thing that ever happened to my television set. He's a tiger, the kind of journalist who comes along once in a lifetime, and he hasn't lost a step along the way. He also brings out the best of everyone who works with him, which is a rare quality, especially in the television business. Hyperbole. Mike, okay. But, but that's, that's, that's fine. I believe it. And I thank you very much indeed for being with well, us today. Well, Steve, I can't think of anyone I'd rather talk to. You know, you've been there, as I say, from the creation. And uh, any question that comes from Steve Scheuer is bound to be a good, interesting, legitimate question for the reason that you, you were there. You're very kind. And thanks again for coming. Appreciate right. it a lot.